Again, thank you very much for joining us today. There's been a great conversation. Um, it was intriguing to me that when I first arrived here on the scene, I, I intruded upon, a, I think, a graduate student who was in cognitive science who let me know upon the articulation of today's theme. He said, well, of course, um, the faster you go, the less you retain, and, and people would try to compensate. Um, so it feels like we're well situated. Um, just sitting down here immediately, a couple of the panel said that they felt that they were both agreeing and disagreeing on many subjects. And with that in mind, I think rather than starting afresh, I'd like to continue some of the strains and thoughts put out there uh, by Dieter and really see if we can pick up on some of those threads. Um, quite simply put, what has res what resonated with you and or what, what did you find disconcerting? <laughs> History is an ominous creature. Um, Jale. Yes. Dieter. Hello. Uh, oddly enough, I found myself, I found the idea that um, we are stuck in a paralysis, in a, path, a pathological paralysis of historicism to intuitively feel right, right, until I take a step back and think about it a little bit. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that a way out, and what I had hoped to present is that a way out of that paralysis invariably has to stitch itself through history. So you move back to go forward. What I, what I hoped to show is that in distinction to art projects that objectify history or reify history and turn it into something still and static and put it on display, there is a way of activating, actualizing uh, potentialities that have been lost in history. And that's where I think that uh, skill and craft come in, in, in a um, general economy and market where objects are not the fetish. Information is, is the fetish. I don't think craft is about objects. I think it's about uh, a sort of re revitalization of process that reflects on, on subjects, that has, that the, the historical project of artists is to put the emphasis on processes, not so much things. Sarah Crowner's thing is not that attractive as a thing. It's, it's a practice that, that is, um, is being unlocked in that thing. So there's, there's, an, there's an interesting, um, at this juncture, simply intuitive set of agreements and disagreements with, um, mm -hmm. with all of the presentations, and especially the last one. Um, um, yeah, just very quickly, because of course this issue of craft was something that I was, uh, that I forced myself to rush through because I spent so much time talking about Brazil. Um, but, um, you know, I think, <clears throat> I'm going to be art historical myself now, um, you know, when the dematerialization of the art object hit the scene in late 60s New York, it was obviously meant as a critical moment. You know, it was a critique of commodity culture and a critique of commodification. And uh, it was meant as a liberation of artistic practice from these constraints. And, you know, this is late 60s. And, and it's interesting to see how art is always, in some sense, prophetic. You know, it's always, it always lags ahead um, because you know in the in the in the canonical history of that moment loosely apart I think the the six years start in 67 and in 73 and 1973 is um, the year that in economic history is not just a year of major global um, energy crisis but also the year I think if I'm not uh, mistaken if my memory serves me right, uh, um, of uh, the end of the gold standard, um, which is you know like the end of monetary of, of you know the monetary economy's anchorage in in matter, 
in gold, in, you know, in material facts. And so it's kind of cynical, of course, to see how artists like Lauren Sweener, um, in retrospect, could be seen to have been the prophets of the virtualization of the world economy. And, and when a couple of years back, um, you know, I think that the, uh, what I always like to think art history in terms of um, what a documenta says every five years. And if you looked at the 1997 documenta that Catherine David um, curated, organized, um, one, the one site that I remember most vividly, even though I don't remember the works in it so much, was the Orangerie, which was this big media lab. You walked in and all these buzzing computers, very MIT in fact. Um, you know, cables, uh, modems, cursors. Somebody talked about cursors today and that was also a nice, did. you did, nice point. Um, you know, so like really still the, the romance well, this uh, utopian expectation of the of the of the emancipatory p uh, potential of all these technologies, and you know, ten years later, the Documenta 12, there wasn't a computer in sight, and of course, a lot of the work that was being shown and produced had been made possible by the use of of computers. But but you know, technology technology as a fetish has kind of receded from view in the in the um, in the arena and and so to kind of now return to this issue of dematerialization and rematerialization i when this issue of rematerialization and this you know reemergence of of an interest an artistic interest in issues of craft and skill and, and, and manual production when they started to emerge i don't know when but quite recently um, i think they were also very critical I mean, a lot of the, the impetus, I think, was also quite critical. And, and that, of course, is what we have to value in that emergence. And not, you know, the sorry or the sad, unfortunate fact that it also coincided with, you know, a, a huge boom in the art market, which, of course, you know, was very quick to capitalize on the return of craftily made objects. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that we aren't seeing, I don't think, a return to craftly made objects, we're seeing the emergence of, of skilled artisanal objects that are really um, filtered through technology. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thompson's model of painting is one that is so, I don't know that he's conscious of it or self-aware or self-reflexive, or, but the, the logic of the cursor is present yeah. in, in the painterly mark. It's not a kind of un, mm -hmm. unreconstructed, um, sure, sure. melancholic yeah. return. Yeah. I have some thoughts about that, but I, I think it's really important for the artist to step in at, at this point. No, please, <laughs> if you would. Um, you, whether in terms of craft or the kinds of artistic production that you're seeing today and how it actually gets contextualized within this conversation, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Be a little more specific. Well, you must have had a response to what was just being said. Oh yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I think I don't know. I always think that the some, sometimes these perspectives, the perspective of of an artist, is slightly different because of the amount of time that's spent with different media. Um, and what I often notice is the change in attitude toward the same media over a period of time. <clears throat> in my case, uh, particularly 16 millimeter film, which I don't often think of as, um, I think of it as a particular medium clearly and I work with it for specific reasons, but um, those haven't really changed over the time period w that the reception of the medium has changed a lot. Um, but it's hard to re I find it hard to relate that directly to the craft or object question. Um, I think that for me, the what I connect those things with more is this question about the change in access to information or the flow of information that you're raising, and that notion of um, how this. It's intriguing to think about attention for historical process or history as a symptom of 
the increased possibility of forgetting. I think that it's that, that outsourcing of memory, as you put it, that also actually has created the opposite of the stereotype that we often hear about attention deficit disorder. I think there is also an attention surplus disorder because there isn't the, the, the economy of memory of, of remembering and forgetting could change. I don't know if it has. Maybe it's not long enough to know if that's actually happening. But this, symptomatically, these books that you were talking about, history of XYZ, I think that does illustrate um, at least that potential of uh, over-fascination and under-consideration of, of where we really are or uh, of what could be most urgent to apply that attention to. And that's something, I guess, um, that I, I, I agree with or I think is interesting in, in the remarks you were making. Um, maybe I'll just throw that out. Do you mean in the sense that one, one has a, a surplus of attention and doesn't know what to do, how to apply, where to look? Yeah, it's not at all, I mean, it's, it's not at all based on what we think of as free time. I mean, I don't, I think that there is also, you know, a dominant way of speaking about contemporary life that is all about the, the just-in-time economy, um, this kind of constant discussion about the lack, the, the speed of things, the lack of boredom, and a, a lot of these theories around fragmentation. Um, but yes, I think on the other hand, you know, there's never, it's never been easier to uh, convince yourself that you have assembled the history of something. And maybe, you know, this, uh, I guess I'm, I'm asking about, rather than thinking so much about um, the symptoms of history, what is the criteria for uh, spending one's time to do one thing versus another? The, 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 how are those decisions, uh, how do they come about for an individual and then also f uh, for receivers? Uh, which th which things do we engage with? In terms of the, in terms of the very subject of your work, or in terms of the m historical model that you approach, I think they're they're totally connected. I think um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to separate them. But so I would say yes, yes. <laughs> um, Jan, you know, how, how might you contextualize even this one project in Kassel, you know, within you know, the, this context? How, how do you see that figuring in or not? <clears throat> I mean, basically, I believe that we, um, or at least I think that history is what basically shape our prison, and that's what we um, act in in our daily, daily life. I think. Uh, I have a much more empirical experience of his history, and um, I want to test things out. And uh, it's true that I really hate this idea of being categorized or being put into a box. I, um, I wanted, basically, with this project to test out what it means to have a gigantic production, like a over-the-top production. What does it really mean? Uh, and Personally, I think I need like this empirical experience of it. Uh, and I'm, I, I think it's just more that it's difficult for me to theorize what it really means. Um, and one, for me, it's I understand it much better by going through it um, logistically, practically. And how would you describe its relationship to history or historical concerns, the way that it shapes the present? Was that what I said? No, I mean, uh, what, I'm, what I mean was that history in general is shaping uh, the daily life that we navigate in. And uh, mostly I don't think about it. But then when I, a project initiates, then I start to 
dig into certain matters. You know what I mean? We have, I mean, probably everybody have like a certain image or uh, projection in what the Statue of Liberty is, and you know, mostly all these things around us we don't think that much about. Or I don't, you know. I mean, I, but then when things collide and you start to research into it, that's when it starts to reveal itself and you deal with it on another level because it becomes the work. Um, but mostly, you know, you, I have all these kind of things around me in my every, everyday life and I just don't think so much about them, you know. After this first installation, are there specific things that began to come to light with this collision for you? Yeah, I learn a lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, just the me, uh, just like facts, you know, just like facts of the emptiness that this Colosseum is based on, like physically fact that the skin is this very thin material. I mean, I <laughs> maybe it's only me, but I, I really didn't knew it, and I think that's interesting in itself, and that's worth reflecting about. But, but that's the thing. So, so the acquisition of facts which sadly become objectified in the display are not an object in the research process that leads up to the making of that piece. And that's, I think, what is, what is the luxury object in, that, in the work of art now, is that you have the ability to take the time to acquire facts, which the rest of us, non-artists, in our surplus of attention, don't have because we're multitasking, like juggling, like the guy in the lobby. So <laughs> it, it's, there's a, I think this, um, patholo this, this paralysis of historicism has to do again with a kind of uneven set of work problems where some people can focus, think, have a process, go through the many layers Whereas that, that's something that is obsolete. It's a dying process. It's, so it's a luxury. I, I and it can be marketed. Yeah, I, would, I would then say that, I mean, uh, millions and millions of people have basically been inside of the Statue of Liberty. It's actually quite obvious, all these information. I mean, I didn't dig into, I mean, in, not in this case, when I'm talking about the the construction of the Statue of Liberty, it's quite obvious information. And it's actually just to look, basically. Oh, to look, to perceive, <laughs> no, normal I mean, analysis. No, I mean, I mean. I mean yeah. I, 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 but that's interesting that you talk about the materiality, this two pennies, pennies thick, kind of tactile, right? So millions of people go and see the Statue of Liberty, but it's just another object of experience, just another sort of touristic. One isn't thinking about materiality, tactility, history. So. Once to make it physical again, yeah, as opposed to seeing through and it. And temporal at the same like time. Jones's flag. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to turn the table a little bit to art history in terms of thinking about how history you know, forms the present and ask, you know, speaking to the, you know, some of the, some of the ideas put forward in, in the framing of, of today's conversation, how is it that history is being dealt with or there is this kind of preoccupation with history at the same time that the contemporary by itself is emerging as an art historical category or preoccupation. Is that a paradox? How do these things work together? What, what is the nature of that present? And I, I, I know, Dieter, you know, from reading your pieces before that you, know, you have touched on you know, this to some extent, you know, this, this kind of obligation to go to the past on, on the part of any number you know, of artworks, or, or curatorially speaking. Yeah in order to allow you know, certain works to even you know, be legible, to have a certain kind of authority? Well, <clears throat> um, yeah, the question of uh, 
periodization is uh, key, of course, to the present discussion because we, you know, you tar you started by singling out the publication of an essay as a benchmark, very, you know, of course, a very um, a debatable one. But you know, I mentioned eighty nine as a break off point. Um, 73, uh, you I'm know, we're totally willing to say that that essay was late to the game. 2002. Yeah. Yo, absolutely, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, completely late to, yeah, the, sure. to yeah. the game. Yeah, is that, in that mm -hmm. part. And actually, many of the pieces discussed are from 97, 99. Sure, sure, exactly, yeah. yeah. But theory, I mean, you know, theory is always kind of, uh, you know, the owl of Minerva always flies out at night. Um, <laughs> you know, as, <laughs> uh, no. But I think it's, uh, there was a, uh, um, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of debate lately as to what is or what is not contemporary art. And um, nobody ever asks what is temporary art. Maybe that's the question and the way to ask. Um, but um, I mean, to me, it's a little bit, I think also that the preoccupation with history, historiogra historiography, and you know, it may well be that we're actually now, that we're kind of um, witnessing the deflating of this huge bubble, which I think for the last 10 years has been, you know, like a major force in contemporary art production. And maybe we're going to see the slight um, decreasing of that, of that trend to more, um, to more manageable proportions. Um, like it also has to do, for me, there's a relation in a way with the resistance, which I talked about in my in, in my presentation, with the resistance to the panoramic view, you know, the um, or or the fact that the panoramic view has become impossible, you know, the grand the master narratives of of of, of historiography that all have all been discredited, sometime in the 60s, sometimes in the 70s, and you know, the discrediting of those master narratives has then become institutionalized as a new academic master narrative in 80s academia. Namely, you know, postmodernism as as as, uh, um, as theory as such. Um, I, you know, I I feel that a lot of the um, because a lot of the historic a lot of the a lot of that historical research, of course, there is of the kind of like you know the history of the cod and the history of the oyster and the history of the bowler hat. Um, you know, this kind of um, interest in min in minutia and in in, in marginalia and and. Uh, and like you know the uh in whatever is in, under threat of being erased because it is so weak, and of course you know art then quickly comes to the rescue in fact of 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 this moment, and in a sense, like you know you're buying the typewriter of Ted Kaczynski of a government uh, auction website is this moment of you know salvaging something that is clearly going to be um um Banished to you know the 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 the, the, the black hole of of oblivion uh, of some sort, but you know still it is like I I see some kind of connection in a way with this uh, with this uh, taboo on thinking on a larger on a larger scale, and that's something that I am interested in. Just you know it's a personal weakness of mine, you know, to kind of see the bigger picture in a way. And which is why I'm interested in looking at certain artistic events and expressions as symptoms, you know, as something that has to be diagnosticized. And of course, you know, I'm part, we're all like, this is, it's a symptom that I have, that I suffer from too. Um, but um, yeah, so, so that's a little bit my, 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 my view. I, there's just this kind of intellectual desire that I have to to kind of return to a type of history writing that is a little bit more ambitious. Yeah. Another symptom of the taboo on um, grand narratives and sort of large swaths of historical thinking, to come back to your question about the paradox of art history and the contemporary, uh, Generally speaking, students students have to be herded and prodded and pushed and required to go to uh, art history classes, survey classes, Renaissance, Baroque, classical, all that stuff. But it's it's always a struggle to thin out the population in the contemporary courses. Bodies in the room are fighting and wrestling with one another. So. You mean historical? Uh, 
contemporary art? Yes, like survey classes? contemporary classes on the contemporary. And of course, those courses always, without any exception that I've ever noted, always begin with the um, disclaimer, none of us know what the contemporary is, mm -hmm. and yet hmm. draws crowds and throngs, and, so and students gonna... won't take the actual history classes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's as though okay. we're outsourcing to artists to yeah. think in terms of, in terms of history. But the problem is that we wouldn't want to revert to the reason for which the grand narrative was tossed mm -hmm. out in sure, the first sure. place. Yeah. So of course, the yeah. history of the oyster, the bowler hat. But on the other hand, post-colonialism had, mm -hmm. had a reason. Sure, huh? sure, of course. Yeah. So, you know, so Nietzsche is saying that, that historical thinking is a symptom of the pathologies of the, of the North Atlantic, which isn't true. I mean, no one is more obsessed with history than, you know, Iranians, for example, I happen to know that. Uh, I mean, everyone's living in the era of Persepolis. Mm -hmm. um, that is already symptomatic of a very Eurocentric, patriarchal, not to say outright racist element in Nietzsche. So, you know, we have to, sure, sure. these have to be subtle moves where we move the dials up and down carefully. It's a shame that, that we're on to the, the history of the, the bowler hat, but mm -hmm. an unreconstructed grand narrative, <clears throat> that so, would be a regressive history. Yeah. But so let me ask you, where does contemporary, where do, where do these courses start? Where does it start? Well, the, the so-called instructor always has a, um, a chance to weigh in on where that begins. The event that I always choose is September 11, so 2001. Oh, and it has a lot of Hirschhorn. Mm. <laughs> I just have one comment to uh, the discussion, and that's, um, I mean, I, maybe it's also because you have another position than me as an artist, mm -hmm. but I, um, uh, I mean, mostly I do my works in, in a gallery, in institutions, which is this well-known white cube which is the perfect place to cut off any information. I mean, if I, as an artist, would act as any, you know, the Salvation Army or, um, yeah, save anything, I shouldn't work in the white cube. I think, as an artist, I think it's the perfect place to illustrate the uh, amputation of information um, to point into the construction of these things, uh, to point to the ideological reason for mm -hmm. why things are created. And, uh, yeah, I think um, along with a recent interest in a rewritten, a critically rewritten understanding of skill and craft is a interest in sites of exhibition. So after several decades of vilification and demonization, the white cube is suddenly interesting again. That's another thing that could have come into this discussion. That institutional critique has made place for institutional desire, or desire for the institution. No? Yeah. He created yeah. institutional desire. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. no other movement in art <coughs> created a love object out mm -hmm. of the institution yeah. than, yeah. than critique of institutions. Um, but I do have a question, though, uh, for Jan and, 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 and Matthew. In, um, where do you feel, like, how does a project um, germinate? Like, where, you know, if upon an invitation by an institution, in your case, for instance, is that where the exhibition is born in the exploration of that space? Or, um, like, because, you know, we've talked about your work, we've seen Matthews, we've talked about this, the Dean, uh, Thomas Hirschhorn, you know, um, artists whose work involves a lot of research. And, and for whom the research library or, or, or other kind of metaphors for the laboratory have replaced the studio. Um, and so for me, I, I, I'm always kind of curious to know how artistic process, how, how the chronology of artistic processes altered, uh, altered through that um, shift in a way, you know, is um, do you have like, was the, was, the, was the Statue of Liberty in the back of your mind for the last 10 years? 
Or really did the Friedrichianum occasion it because it's the first ever museum, it's the oldest museum in the world in many ways, or? <clears throat> no, I mean, there's not like one way of working, like, yeah. um, and uh, I mean, I'm not interested, um, there's not one method of working, and I'm not so much interested either in uh, in understanding where things come from. I mean, um, this is, I mean, you know, like, of course I came up with this silly idea that I wanted to stuff Friedrich Shannon with something yeah. big, but looking back, I mean, of course I have, like, you know, there's this amazing painting I always really love from Martin Wong, where he die cut the Statue of Liberty, revealing the circular staircase inside of her, and she looks like a big mess. Yeah. Um, but, you know, things just come together yeah. with all the information that you gather, like, uh, not in research libraries, yeah. or, but also through colleagues and yeah, through yeah. talks, through yeah. anything. Sure. Um, <clears throat> no, I guess I think a little bit in terms of constellations, and there's a, on a practical level, just speaking personally, there's a kind of um, para archive that I maintain of possible projects, you know, some of which I actually work on a lot without any clear notion that they'll that I'll have a chance to do them, or that that it will actually uh, com be completely realized. So, I guess it's a little bit of a genealogy of the relationships among projects, and there's probably a separate, also practical economy of how far certain things get before I have a chance to actually do them. So it's. Um, it was something that I thought a lot about starting out 15 years ago or so, noticing right away this desire, expectation around the institution and um, the, the shift in the notion of the meaning of place in relation to exhibition, the sort of discarding of uh, site specificity, and then a kind of nothing replacing that until uh, uh, site relation or discourse specificity, those things came out or came into the dialogue. Um, so I guess I've often, I, early on, I developed a kind of protective mode of doing the work that, that uh, where I think my attention could, could be best used and sort of not worrying about when and where, what schedule that's on, you know, in a certain way. I think at this point we'd like to open up the floor to questions. Uh, if you could, if when asking a question, just go to the microphone there and uh, you'll be duly documented and continue conversation in an open fashion. <laughs> 